Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Murphy. I'm the production director for the World Orphan Drug Congress USA. Thank you so much for joining us this morning or afternoon, wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, so we're excited for today's discussion, which is brought to you by Satara Cell and Gene Therapy, um, and is the third in our series of the World Orphan Drug uh, Congress webinar series for 2021. Um, if you'd like to go see our old webinars, you can visit on our website. Um, and so we have uh, two experts leading the discussion today, which is entitled Commercial and Regulatory Success in Accelerated Gene Therapy Development. Um, if you're dialed in over your computer, you'll see the control panel on your screen. Um, there will be a drop down where you can submit questions at any point in time. Um, our speakers will be addressing them throughout um, the webinar today and at the end. <clears throat> and if you're interested in participating in a webinar in the future, either as a sponsor or as a panelist, uh, please feel free to reach out to a WODC team member for more information. So without further ado, let me introduce to you today's speakers. We have Emily Woodward. She's Director of Customer Engagement at Synchrogenics. And Max Vargas, he's Senior Director of US Access Strategies at Satara Evidence and Access. So Emily, Max, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Claire. So um, hey, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, Emily and I will be talking to you uh, for about you know, 40 minutes or so. Um, and then, uh, as Claire mentioned, we hope that uh, there's this is somewhat dynamic, so you can have some questions during the uh, during the talk. We'll pause and, and address those as as needed, um, and then we'll also have time for questions at the end as well. Um, so um, I'll just give a little bit of a background on uh, on our presenters today. Uh, first, uh, Emily Woodward, Director of Customer Engagement, um, and uh, her background is in immunology. Uh, but in her professional world has uh, experienced, as you can see here, in oncology, autoimmunity, rare diseases, and transcriptional regulation. Uh, and myself, I'm Senior Director, U.S. Access Strategy and Account Management uh, with our Evidence and Access Group. And uh, my day-to-day -day is primarily overseeing projects in uh, launch pricing, contracting, market segmentation, due diligence, uh, and and some of those uh, more finer points about price and access. So we're very excited to speak to you today. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily who has the first uh, section and take us away, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna divide our talk up into three parts. Uh, today, I'm gonna do a brief sort of overview on the regulatory um, uh, framework that, that governs uh, gene and cell therapies in the US specifically. Then we're gonna hand it back over to Max who's gonna talk about kind of some commercialization topics. And then we're gonna talk together at the end of it and, and try to integrate the two. So um, without further ado, again, uh, so about regulatory here, here we go. Um, so we're going to be focusing on the US FDA today um, and doing a side by side of regulations in different markets would be an entire talk of its own. So no disrespect at all meant to Japan or EMA or, or any other major health market. Um, but with that being said, right, that we are focusing on the FDA. In broad strokes, regulators in those major markets are actually approaching gene and cell therapy very similarly in a lot of ways, particularly in terms of the concepts that they use, um, the, the way they're harmonizing some of the approaches, particularly around acceleration and things. Um, so the concepts are, are, you know, fairly similar, even though you'll hear, you know, the acronyms are, are completely different, of course. Um, so in general, gene therapies fall into two major categories with uh, quite a lot of overlap in, in some cases, uh, gene therapies and cell therapies. So gene therapies, of course, include things like viral vectors um, that are carrying transgenes to a bodily target, as an example. Um, and then cellular therapies are just that, they're cells, and they may or may not be modified genetically ex vivo, so in a, in a Petri dish or a test tube. Um, most of the examples you'll hear uh, Max and I talk about today are actually going to be gene therapies. They fall into that category. That's just by chance. And you will hear both of us say gene therapy and gene and cell therapy and cell therapy all interchangeably. Um, it's just, you know, uh, just uh, the, the nature of the beast. They're not meant to imply anything specifically for one of these. 
the other. Um, gene therapies, uh, point take on point of this slide is gene therapies are biologics and are therefore regulated by CBER um, or the Center for Biologics, Biologics Evaluation and Research at FDA. And the review office is OTAT, um, so the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies, which is, um, I think, an improvement over OCTGT because you can actually say OTAT. Um, so in the as, as sort of highlighted by some of the bullets here up at the top, gene and cell therapies are not at all a homogenous group of, of, of products. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, heterogeneity. Here we go. Look at that. Look how smooth that was. Um, so not homogenous at all, right? Um, so um, not only are gene and cell therapies different, but within those categories, there is quite a bit of diversity in terms of the types of products that we're seeing. Um, and that diversity and the specifics of those products are going to incredibly influence the design of the development program uh, that, that will be undertaken. Um, for each one of those products. So things like the delivery mechanism, what kind of vector you've used, the molecular biology of the construct, um, including any kind of promoters, other transcriptional regulation elements that you may or may not have um, encoded in that in that product, the target genes themselves that, that you're focusing on, um, and then the physiological background of the disease under study. All of these things are gonna influence um, the development program, the design of your studies, the level of evidence um, that the regulators are going to want to see, um, going to influence what payers are going to probably want to want to think about or, or look at. <clears throat> so the take-home message then, right, is what do you do with all of this heterogeneity? It's it's all over the place. Is to talk uh, to to the agency as early and often as possible, um, and communicating uh, with FDA or EMA or PMDA um, early and often is going to ensure alignment. Uh, between you and the regulator, and also is hopefully going to translate into streamlined uh, a streamlined development program. Um, so to that end, next slide, <laughs> I want to remind the audience of the expedited mechanisms that are available from FDA um, that gene and cell therapies are eligible to participate in. So there's not a unique framework per se, right, for gene and cell therapies. You are taking advantage of existing expedited programs for rare, uh, rare and orphan diseases and, and for drugs or, or products that, you know, represent a major uh, breakthrough or advancement in, in, in therapy of some kind. Um, these uh, designations are not mutually exclusive, um, and I would encourage sponsors to apply for any and all of the programs that apply to the product that you're developing. And in terms of application or what, what which ones do or do not apply, that's listed in the first bullet across the, the top there. Um, so it's it's a very, very pared down uh, version of, of uh, which kinds of products to, can, you know, are eligible for each designation, uh, but it gives you a, you know, a high level sort of framework there. Uh, what you can see in the second bullet for all of the designations is that the consistent benefit um, <clears throat> of the four designations is in increased interaction with FDA staff. Um, and that is that is the thing that, you know, is the real serious benefit in, in terms of, 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 of my opinion um, for, for sponsors or developers who, who are um, developing gene and cell therapy products. Bears repeating that designations are not approvals, right? So, um, and they in no way change the level of safety and effectiveness data that you need to demonstrate for a marketing authorization. Um, on a previous slide, I mentioned that, you know, FDA and EMA particularly, there's uh, quite a bit of harmonization there. Um, one of the, the schemes or programs in, in Europe that are uh, that is available to these kind of products is the prime scheme so the priority medicine scheme um, it's very similar to <clears throat> fast track and breakthrough and RMAT designation um, in terms of offering um, much more intensive interactions with EMA and accelerating the development um, of, of those priority medicines that represent some kind of major public health interest um, or improvement in, in, in a major public health interest. Um, so I'd like to chat a second about accelerated approvals um, because as opposed to a designation that's more of um, you know an approval pathway. So you've got traditional approval versus accelerated approval. And what an accelerated approval is, and as you guys are probably very aware, um, is, and is a, an approval that is based on a surrogate or an intermediate endpoint. 
that is likely to predict a clinically meaningful benefit. So, you know, it's a biomarker, you're, you're, you know, you're measuring a protein or you're measuring some kind of intermediate clinical um, effect that is not something uh, long-term, say, like mortality. That's the, the classic example. So the intent of accelerated approval is to get the product on the market as soon as possible, um, to begin benefiting patients earlier than would happen if you had to wait on those long-term outcome measurements. <clears throat> and um, the caveat, I guess, uh, if you can call it a caveat, um, is that acceler accelerated approvals come with post-marketing requirements um, in the form of additional studies. Um, and in the worst case scenario, an accelerated approval can actually be uh, withdrawn uh, for various reasons, either you know you didn't conduct the studies that you said you were gonna conduct or, or the evidence that came out of your long-term follow-up studies did not support uh, the approval the, the way that we thought it would. That's not actually a very common thing. I think that um, since since uh, 1992, I think was when accelerated approval started. Um, as of June of last year, only 198 drugs had received accelerated approval and 12 of those had been withdrawn. So it's not very common, uh, but it has happened. Um, and withdrawals have happened actually in the EU as well. So, um, you know, post-marketing commitments are, are something to, to not be uh, taken lightly here. Um, the takeaway, I think, then for the accelerated approval box is that early interactions uh, provided for by the designations that you may receive early in your development program uh, allow you the opportunity to discuss potential surrogate and intermediate endpoints um, that could be used to uh, support that accelerated approval. And Max, did you have a comment or did you want to comment on surrogate and uh, endpoints here or do we want to save that for, for a little bit later on? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just mention to the group that we're going we're, we're gonna to go through a case study of where, you know, this, this product had an accelerator approval, you know, pathway and um, basically uh, <laughs> the, the regulatory endpoint that was agreed upon for, you know, for approval uh, with the agency. Uh, was very, uh, very much not meaningful to the end users and end payers, um, and so that that created a, a quite a bit of tension uh, within this uh, within this client company. But it's a story. We'll get to it uh, when when we get to that slide. Awesome. So how do we get started? Yeah, next slide. Awesome. Um, how do we get started? You know, it, just even even coming up with a development program. One really good way is to make use of the available guidance documents that are already out there that um, these are all from FDA. There are similar ones um, from EMA and others. So and, and what I've got here is just a sampling, actually. So this is not a comprehensive list of gene and cell therapy guidance documents. It's just uh, just sort of a, a high level list. And on the left hand side, what you can see are uh, what I'm calling cross-cutting guidance. So they apply to lots of different types of products. For example, the long-term follow-up um, guidance, you know, gives quite a bit of very detailed information about how to design a long-term follow-up study. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, we've got therapeutic area or disease-specific guidances um, that are, um, well, specific to an individual disease. Uh, these are, th this is this is actually, I'm going to tell a slight small anecdote here. When I started 15 years ago, I was developing a uh, stem cell therapeutic for um, type 1 diabetes, so out of cadaveric pancreatic islets. And um, to see, and that was, that was before the, the guidance that you see on the screen there, that was before before that came out. So to see that there is now, you know, a guidance for something that I was trying to do 15 years ago is actually pretty cool. Um, and it shows how far um, the FDA has come in supporting gene and ther cell therapy products and their development um, in actually what is a pretty, pretty short time. Um, those of us too who were in uh, the business uh, at that point probably remember that there were lots of startups and things, you know, that that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago that uh, fell by the wayside. So it's it's and now we're at a point um, in in the industry where we've actually got approved products. So it's it's fantastic to see, you know, the change there. Okay, 
So <laughs> history lesson aside, um, the therapeutic area guidances, I think, are the ones that I want to focus on here. They're incredibly useful. Um, they detail all sorts of things uh, to guide your development program, to guide your study designs, to guide long-term follow-up, um, endpoint selection, all sorts of things. So if you happen to be in an area or focusing on a disease that does have one of these uh, specific TA guidances, then you know avail yourself of that. Um, they are absolutely indispensable. Um, for example, uh, just to, to give a, a brief high-level example, the hemophilia uh, guidance does mention, obviously, annualized bleeding rate um, as the primary endpoint of choice if you're going to go for a traditional approval. And remember, we talked about traditional versus accelerated approvals earlier. Um, because clotting factors, right? So maybe your gene therapy is is delivering um, a transgene to to make you transcribe and and produce a, a clotting factor as a protein. Um, measuring those levels, you know, obviously those are not validated, um, you know, accepted uh, clinical endpoints. And so annualized bleeding rate is the thing you'd go for for traditional approval. Um, but you can use the uh, factor levels as, um, a, as a surrogate endpoint for an accelerated approval. Now that does mean you have to do extra work down the line um, in terms of substantiating that your assay method, for example, for the, um, for the factor level is um, you know, reliable and repeatable. Um, and that also <clears throat> that the level of uh, you know, uh, clotting factor that you're measuring actually will uh, translate into some kind of clinical uh, benefit down the line. And obviously you're probably gonna have to do post-marketing studies where you relate or validate your clotting factor activity levels to annualized bleeding rate. Um, so, and all of that is covered in the hemophilia guidance. Um, so they are they are incredibly useful if you happen to, um, if there happens to be one for the area that you're studying. Um, so how do you get started talking to the agency? Um, and yep, here we go. <laughs> it's uh, not really any different for the most part. There is one difference. It's not really any different for gene and cell therapies than it is for, um, you know, any other drug that is uh, going down the, you know, um, orphan or breakthrough uh, designation type of a pathway. Um, and that is either, you know, the way you interact with the agency is either through written feedback um, or through formal type B meetings. And um, we, you guys probably are all very aware of um, that there are established checkpoints during development um, when these meetings with the agency occur, like the pre-IND meeting or pre-BLA meeting. Um, and the importance of these communications, these interactions, um, cannot be like overstated. There's no way. Um, I found a statistic uh, in preparing for this talk on FDA's website um, that mentioned sponsors who availed themselves of a pre-IND meeting. Um, the development time for their drug on average went from 12.8 years to 7.1 years. So 7.1 years uh, in development if you had a pre-IND meeting, 12.8 years if you didn't have a pre-IND meeting. That's huge. That's six years off your development timeline um, just for having a couple of conversations. So it really is a very, very much a value add. Types of questions that you ask, um, you know, in, in these meetings <clears throat> are going to vary, obviously, depending on the product and also the stage of development that you're at um, with one that, you know, we've been talking about um, or alluding to several times here already is, are my proposed surrogate or intermediate endpoints appropriate? Um, that would be um, a thing to discuss with the agency, particularly if, uh, not to give spoilers for the end of the talk, if you are availing, you know, yourself of, um, say, patient um, patient focused data and you're trying to go after a novel endpoint, you know, you might want to discuss that early on uh, with the agency. They are open to that. So um, the one meeting that is uh, unique, different, or new, I guess I should say, um, and gene and cell therapy uh, developers should definitely take advantage of is the interact meeting. Um, and so that'll be the next slide. Unless Max, you wanted to talk more about surrogate or intermediate endpoints at this point, we can. Yeah, well, I was just to be, for your earlier conversation on hemophilia, um, I was going to bring up the, you know, some of you may have read the, the recent uh, BioMarin CRL 
um, you know, back in, uh, back in August. Um, I believe it was August. And, um, you know, that was the, I, 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 you can kind of see how that came to be, right? They had agreed on factor level as, this is an hemophilia, they had agreed on factor level as, a, as an approvable endpoint, et cetera. Um, and then they came back and said, you know, we want, now we want annualized bleeding rate. And yeah. the, the two reason, years. of course, yeah, two years yeah. of it, right. And the reason, of course, um, was that there was that, you know, that dreadful drop off that, that was sort of, you know, you, you saw it in the graph and you're like, oh, what, what does that mean? So, um, you know, that, that clearly, you know, provided a, a rationale for FDA to do that. But I think it really stresses the importance of understanding what those, even if you've agreed on a, on an accelerated approval endpoint, a surrogate endpoint, really have to understand what that means for the ultimate approval and then the commercial implications, which I'll get into. But, and it also highlights the importance of these early and frequent interactions with, uh, with the agency. And let's face it, right? Um, there are three approved uh, in the US, uh, last time I checked, it could be more, <laughs> but there are three approved gene therapies, gene therapies, so there are more cellular therapies, but three approved gene therapies um, in, in the US. They, we haven't, they haven't been around long enough, right, for us to really get a good feeling for durability of effect, and, and Max's example about Biomarin is, is absolutely around durability um, of effect, which is something you can address um, in long-term follow-up studies, not only obviously for safety, but for, you can look at efficacy as well. Um, and those would be very valuable um, data points to, to gather for, for several reasons. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so interact meetings. So let's go to, yeah, there we go. So what is an interact meeting? Um, they were established in 2018. So I wouldn't blame you if you hadn't heard of it, but probably um, I think everybody that's in this, this uh, industry is, is pretty savvy now. So you've probably heard of an interact meeting. Um, it wins my personal award for worst uh, acronym ever. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, so yeah, so 2018 and uh, the SOP for our FDA's SOP for how to develop a briefing package for um, an interact meeting actually only came out um, in 2020. So it, you know, it is you know, new and new and fancy in some ways. Um, and in other ways, it's not. So what it does is it replaces the pre pre IND meeting. So this is very, very early in your preclinical development um, phase, right? It does not replace your pre IND meeting. So you can do both. You basically have your interact first and then later on in your preclinical sort of program when you're when you're getting ready to put in your IND, go ahead and have a pre-IND meeting. Um, and I do encourage sponsors to take advantage of both meetings, definitely. Um, interact meetings are applicable to innovative products um, that are very early in development. That's shown in that first box there. Um, and what it means is if you if you read through you know the guidance and the S and FDA's SOP, if you have a platform right? Um, so you have a, a delivery mechanism or a liposome or a vector or something like that. So a platform, but you don't actually have a therapeutic product that you're looking to develop, then you're probably not going to get an interact meeting. Um, and probably what you need to do is go for a cat meeting instead. Um, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. But, um, you know, suffice to say here, um, an interact meeting can be denied. Um, usually what I've heard of when, when, when they do get denied is that you're actually too far along. Um, so it's not that they don't want to talk to you at all. It's just they want you to go ahead and do your pre-IND meeting and, and, and instead of doing a, an interact meeting. So it's not a bad thing, but it's just sort of like you missed your chance to talk to them early on. Um, so they do get denied. Um, the other reason they can be denied or main reason is if uh, your briefing package is insufficient. So you do have to have some pre-formulated questions um, and those are listed in the last box there, you know, sort of the, the way that the briefing package is designed. It's the same as for um, any, any formal type B meeting. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the questions that are and are not uh, sort of on the, on the table and that's on the next slide. Um, there we go. Uh, so things you can and can't talk about uh, in an interact meeting. Um, FDA is very interested in talking to you about, uh, well, CBER specifically is very interested in talking to you about specific hurdles uh, uh, to your CMC development, for example. So product specific um, hurdles and the design of some non-clinical studies that are proof of concept um, or 
um, biodistribution and very, very early uh, non-clinical type of studies. If you go to them and in your, your question list, you're trying to talk about definitive uh, farm talk studies, um, for example, or you're really trying to hammer out uh, the, the design of your first in human trial, they're probably, you know, going to say, nope, that's, that's later, that's pre-IND stuff to come back to us later on uh, when you're, when you're ready to talk, talk about that. Again, and as I mentioned on the, on the prior slide, if you you have a platform and not a product, then what you should be looking for is a CAT meeting or a CBER advanced technologies team meeting. That's the first uh, block, that block of bullets in the in the red box there. Um, so that yeah, there we go. So that's really, um, that's what those are for. Um, you can have both if you're a developer that has a platform, a really innovative platform, and you're going to be going for a particular, um, you know, uh, disease target and a, and a specific product. There's no reason you can't do both. Um, but that is sort of the delineation between between the two and where the, um, where the remit falls for, for both groups. Um, so one point I haven't touched on uh, yet, and we're going to briefly do in the next slide, is uh, the importance of CMC development. Now, I am not a CMC specialist at all. Um, if we've got any CMC questions that pop up after the talk, I'm going to have to refer you to one of my colleagues. Um, but what I do know and what I have heard over and over again from um, CBER representatives, including Peter Marks, is it is so important to tackle CMC issues early, head on, um, and, and get them out of the way. Because, I mean, in, let's face it, in some cases, you um, could see efficacy after one dose, um, right, of, of your, your gene or cell therapy. So your development timeline is shortened, with, but you, your re requirements for CMC data are not at all reduced, right? So you have to pack all of that in to a very, very short amount of time. And the worst thing I think that could happen is, you get to the end of your your pivotal data collection, you know, the end of your phase three, um, and you don't have a product that can go on market, um, and that would be regrettable. <laughs> and and I think that that's something that uh, CBER is very concerned about. So they're they're very happy to talk about CMC hurdles um, early early and often. Um, another reason to talk about CMC early uh, in development development instead of sort of waiting um, uh, is to um, is because rather I should say limitations in production capacity. For example. Um, so maybe, you know, you're, you're developing um, a, a viral vector or a, some kind of liposome or something that has a construct in it and you can only get a certain amount of it out, you know, in every batch. That's going to impact how you design your clinical studies. Um, and you may have to have a conversation with the agency about characterizing doses that are actually feasible as opposed to the doses you might want to characterize could you you know if you could make as much as as you could possibly make um, so there's lots of reasons to to talk about start talking about CMC um, early and often and there we go I think that's it for that oh, I think it's over to you Max thanks Emily so now we're going to talk about um, some of the uh, you know some of the pricing access and reimbursement considerations that um, that gene therapy developers uh, will have faced and will have to face going forward. Um, so here, as I mentioned, um, that story at the beginning. So here's, I'm gonna tell you a story here. Um, and this was about um, basically, as it says in the headline, the commercial implications of the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, and, and how those criteria when, when you look at it from a payer lens and you build in price and you build in the clinical data that was available at the time of launch to support the value, what are the implications of that clinical trial design on basically the commercial potential and the revenue objectives uh, that this, this particular client had? So a bit about the, I'll just kind of go through the boxes. The client was a global biotech, uh, rare disease uh, focused, um, and with regards to this particular compound, this particular product, they had very clear revenue objectives um, that, you know, were, you know, they're, they're, they're flexible, but, <laughs> you know, th those, those objectives were generally set uh, by, by the company. And also the clinical trial design had been already kind of worked out between the company and 
uh, and the agency. The issue was that uh, the commercial implications, as I said before, had not really been assessed. The, the, the implications of the clinical trial design and the clinical trial strategy there had not really been assessed from a commercial perspective. So what, um, what happened here was that the, uh, the commercial leadership of this company said, you know, I, I look at this trial design, I look at my, my, my sort of aspirational forecast, I look at what, I, what I'm thinking in terms of price and access coverage. I just wanna make sure that with this design, at this time of launch, because this was a, an accelerated uh, approval, so surrogate biomarker, uh, something we've been talking about before. I wanna make sure that this particular data package will be acceptable, reimbursable, with you know, modest uh, access controls and so forth um, by, by the payer community. Uh, to basically allow us to to gain the revenue we need to support continued development here. Um, and so what we did was we worked out some some clinical trial designs and options really and assessed them across a fixed set of prices uh, with um, with the payer stakeholders in the US and basically found that you know there was the the the, the because the inclusion and exclusion criteria were were overly restrictive and basically really narrowed the population to show a benefit. Um, again, this was okay with FDA. That had already been, you know, been, been agreed. Um, but those that that kind of trial and the data that that would that would create uh, was not supportive of the price that, uh, or set of prices really that uh, that the commercial team were were kind of thinking in the uh, as a as a range. So then the question, of course, becomes, okay, well, if this is our data package at launch, we only have data on the surrogate endpoint, there, you know something has to give because it's a bit of a tug of war. We either change the uh, the, the trial design uh, and get FDA to agree with that and uh, you know maybe broaden the inclusion exclusion criteria a bit or, we relax on the price of it, and you know it's a there's a relationship there, uh, and 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 that so that's what we did for this company was basically helped uncover that relationship and find a middle ground between uh, clinical and commercial such that they went back to FDA, amended the trial design. Commercial was happy because it was you know it it, it was sort of it was evidence based right I mean it was evidence based assessment of uh, their clinical trial design to achieve the, the, the revenue objectives that they had. So it, it all worked out in the end, but it was a, it was a, uh, there was a, a bit of a, a bit of a battle there between um, clinical, clinical and commercial, very professional battle, very, uh, you know, very, uh, no blood was spilt, but it was, uh, but it was a, it was an interesting project because it really highlighted how those considerations that you can sort of, sort of make and sort of, de facto decide upon very early in development uh, can can ripple through all the way through to uh, to your potential commercial potential down down the line. So um, this slide kind of illustrates a bit more about that that concept. So you know you have in your trial population here you have an indicated population which you think you know you kind of go back and forth with FDA and what the indication could or should be. But your actual enrolled population is a subset of that in most cases, uh, with some criteria, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a discussion, you know, between the manufacturer and FDA. Now, in the case of um, particularly, it's particularly acute in the case of accelerated approvals where uh, the data to support the value at launch is is it's really only surrogate, right? You don't you haven't formally shown a clinical benefit. Uh, until you do those post-marketing commitments that Emily talked about. Um, so in the face of that sort of paucity of data, combined with the very high prices that we all know these things are, 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 are going to command, um, that basically forces payers to uh, clamp down a bit and say, well, you know, your reimbursable population, from my perspective, is really only going to be your enrolled population. 
And that was the issue with the with the story I mentioned on the prior slide that you know it just the, those two did not did not align from a revenue perspective. Um, so so what do you do about it? I mean you know th and the bullets on the bottom kind of talk about um, you know what some of the questions that uh, that the payers are are thinking about when they're assessing here. Uh, we brought up durability already with the biomarin example. Um, and you know <clears throat> that's that's really what they're looking for because again, you're asking for a, a big uh, an initial outlay of money um, with benefit that is extended over many, many years. Um, and then the question becomes, as it says on the bottom here, perhaps we should limit access to those where we absolutely know will benefit and if you take a very you know hard line view of that, it's really the enrolled population. So, you know, various attempts have uh, you know have been utilized to um, to address this uncertainty in the evidence package um, at the at the point of evaluation because the whole point here is the the earlier the assessment happens in terms of a, a payer view or HTA. Uh, health technology assessment, the earlier that happens, the less mature the data is. And again, particularly acute with the with the accelerated approvals. Um, so the HTA agencies are, you know, really they're creating specific uh, evaluation pathways so that the, the, the standard methods don't really, may not really uh, fit as well. Um, you, you know, some of you may remember the, the ICER evaluation uh, for Zolgensma, that was cost effective at over two million, um, you know, which which showed that uh, a lot of these gene therapies, if you think about it just from an abstract perspective with lifetime benefits, um, could be cost effective at very, very high prices, still be cost effective at very, very high price points. Um, and that's really, of course, you know, if you're paying now for a lifetime of, of clinical benefit. Um, and it really just brings up questions about uh, affordability in the short term, durability in the long term. Um, so the, the, what the market has responded with is basically we, we, need, a, we need different approaches, right? I mean, this, this is, that doesn't, might not work. Um, and on the right side of the slide, what you can see is uh, an al alternative approach uh, proposed by Bluebird Bio um, for the Zintegro launch, which would basically say, we're, you know, these societal value and cost offsets, we're just going to pull that out of the equation and only count the, you know, th these two benefits, the life extension and the quality of life in the, um, in the, in the assessment. But of course, this is, this is not good news to manufacturers because it sort of says, well, we do have, we are providing value on these, these metrics here, societal and cost offsets, especially in cases where you have a very high uh, supportive care, very high standard of care uh, cost already, which perhaps could be eliminated with uh, with the gene therapy. It still, even with this, still may result in very high cost effectiveness or you know, prices that that are very high, but still uh, hit the cost effectiveness uh, threshold. So basically, what we're saying here is, you know, there there has to be some change um, and a and a and a um, you know, a break in, um, in, in, in addressing some of these issues. So on the next slide here, I'm gonna talk about um, some things we've talked about, some things we've seen in the US market. Uh, I'll contrast that with some European approaches uh, and then we'll kind of bring them together in a, in a minute or two. So, um, you know, on the US side, they have these main concerns here on the left, actuarial uncertainty, therapeutic performance and payment timing. I've touched upon you know all of these uh, uh, already, um, and so on the right side of the slide, some options. You know, some options to consider um, to uh, to address these issues. So, and again, the whole issue here is you're collapsing a whole lifetime of benefit into a one-time administration potentially, uh, which which uh, raises the um, the uh, the affordability concerns. Um, so, you know the the We'll just kind of go around this. There's performance risk sharing, generally moving some level of financial risk to uh, shared between the the manufacturer and the and the payer, um, based on uh, actual performance of the 
of the product in some way. And then of course, it's a, uh, a very detailed discussion about how we measure, how long, et cetera. And often those break down, to be quite honest. Um, annuities and installments uh, basically help to, uh, you know, for, for smaller, smaller pools of, of members and mitigate the actuarial risk um, as an option to do that. Drug licensing, the Netflix model, et cetera, um, ensuring access for a given patient population uh, for a fixed cost. Um, and then re reinsurance stop loss. I mean, most you know, everybody has this now, but it's being talked about as you know maybe we need to sort of make a make a, ver a, a dedicated version of this for gene you know more advanced ther therapies, gene and cell therapies. So on the next slide, um, talk about some uh, you know arguably Europe is a little bit more advanced here uh, in terms of their. Uh, you know, their, their options here to accelerate access, um, particularly with, um, you know, different, different mechanisms that you can see here on the, uh, in the, in the dark blue bubbles. Um, generally termed early access programs, um, you know, they're, they basically provide ways uh, through all of these, these, these little bubbles here for uh, the manufacturer and the health system to provide access um, while also potentially mitigating their risk. So you have outcomes-based rebates, you know, again, based on the performance, uh, deferred payments, installment options, and basically just spread it out over a time. Uh, but then you're thinking durability concern that we talked about earlier, uh, retroactive rebates, um, and basically saying that um, we'll, we'll, we'll have access now uh, and we'll get into the Novartis program in a minute, but we'll have access now. And then once we do the HTA process, anything that we decide over, you know, after that process will be retroactively applied. So if there is a cost concession at the end of that process, we apply it retroactively. Um, specialized training for treating institutions, um, that's sort of becoming, you know, part and parcel of the of of the approach um, and, and we do that here in the US as well even for non non gene therapies um, and then registry uh, access you know the um, the th this provides a source of data um, to manufacturers and the health systems to appropriately measure the performance but the point is here this is all pointing to a data driven approach beyond the trial um, and it's it's a continued evidence generation uh, so that you have the flexibility to measure outcomes and measure uh, performance. So the Novartis, you know, th th this is a little bit of uh, detail on the Novartis program, and I'm just going to accelerate a bit uh, on my pace here. Um, but you know, generally, this is this is this is pretty good uh, for. Um, you know, for Novartis and Avexis, you can see the rationale here uh, sets a high list price. And we sort of say, we'll do the, this is the day one access program. We'll, we'll do the, the HTA negotiations later. Uh, and we'll talk about that later, but these patients need access now. And everyone can generally agree with that. Um, and in that intervening time, uh, the manufacturer is collecting additional data uh, to help support the value prior to doing that HTA assessment. Um, and of course, it's it's bringing a tighter link between uh, product and and patient um, because they're already on it. Um, the upsides, of course, patients on drugs sooner, uh, guaranteed rebates could help lower the risk. Um, you know that because again, that's that there's that understanding that after the HTA process concludes, there may be something retroactively applied. However, there are some downsides. the The budget impact is still immediate. Um, and uh, it sort of impacts the ability to negotiate because you've already got patients on drug. Um, and then, you know, imagine if, uh, imagine if uh, those HTA negotiations resulted in, uh, you know, less favorable access than they had on day one, there would be substantial uh, pushback from the patient community. So I'm gonna skip this slide, just a few quotes from, uh, from uh, some, some European payers on this, but just in the interest of time. Um, successful payer pharma negotiations in the context of gene therapy centers around these four major components, 
value definition? Do you agree on, on the co concepts of value uh, and the tenets of value uh, for this product, for this patient population? Some level of risk sharing. Um, and you know that can that there's a whole spectrum there, but but some level of risk sharing has to be a part of it because um, you know of the of the affordability and durability concerns that we talked about. Uh, health system affordability. Um, just thinking forward about you know all of the benefits to uh, having patients on these on these innovative therapies uh, and sort of bringing that back into the into the definition of the value and then real world evidence because. All of this is going to be, um, you know, these are usually small populations, at least now. Um, and so the clinical data is often, you know, fairly modest. And so collecting real world evidence is, uh, is very important once it's in market to substantiate the value and continue to substantiate the value over the lifetime of the product. So um, at this point, um, we're, our next section here is going to be on integrated uh, gene therapy development. Uh, and really just a couple of points on where we see we can, we can sort of harmonize between the regulatory process and the, and the commercial implications and really come together and have a, um, a differentiated approach. This slide I'll just breeze through. It's just to say that, yes, we have few gene therapies, but we won't very soon. Uh, we, we will have many. Um, and therefore, you kind of think about it as, as sort of in the orphan drug space when, when those were new, um, you know, it, it was, it's non-competitive, right? That's kind of by definition. Um, but as we look at, this is just, these are just some screen grabs from, uh, from the pipeline reports. Um, these, not only will gene therapies in general grow, but gene therapies for similar indications will grow and then creating a, a competitive environment. So, um, you know, very as I said, very much like we've seen in the orphan space. Now you have multiple drugs for um, very small, uh, very small populations. So they have choice, and choice means competition. Um, this is another case study about um, sort of bringing in some of that commercial thinking. Uh, very, very early. So I just want to impress upon the audience: there's no early, you know. This, if you think this is, uh, there's no early time, too early time to start. Basically, they had a product um, or, or platform, really. Um, lentiviral vector efficiently deliver RNAs in vitro and in vivo. Okay, so that's, they have a technology that can do that. And then it's like, well, great. What, what do we do with it? So um, the leadership kind of wanted to assess this from a commercial perspective first and then get into the sort of more technical and um, you know, feasibility approaches uh, after that. So what we did was um, multi-step sort of filtering process, uh, looked at over 200 indications where RNA expression would, would lead to a therapeutic effect. Um, you select those uh, based on some criteria, we got it down to 25, and then further evaluated using uh, some more uh, commercial and competitive uh, filters. Um, and then developed sort of some some draft product profiles for uh, some indications um, that were kind of split up into gateway indications based on feasibility and value indications based on ROI. And then brought those through those potential products through to testing uh, with the with the relevant stakeholders. So what did they derive out of this? Um, you know, they the client and their investors primarily. This was a pretty early stage company, as you can imagine. So their investors were heavily involved. Um, you know, I think it gave the investors a lot of comfort that there had been this commercial uh, rigor established all the way very, very early um, so that they were confident that anything that gets brought forward is gonna have a, you know, at least, at least has some level of commercial assessment already, already built into it. So Emily, over to you. Yeah, so there's this, Max has already touched on, uh, you know, never too early, right? Never too early. And there's this concept in um, medical devices and software development and, and other other areas that I've been in before, which when I transitioned into pharma, I realized, well, it didn't didn't seem like it was thought of in the same way. And what is that concept? It's the concept of the, your end user inputs, 
right? So I think what Max and I are talking about and, and, and going back and forth here and trying to encourage is, you know, talk to, talk to your patients, talk to the regulators, talk to physicians, talk to payers, um, and integrate all of those end user inputs. Those are the, those are the folks in the groups that are going to be your consumers. Integrate those into very early, even TPP development, you know, get it, get it so that all the data that you are going to be um, collecting over the course of your development program is aligned um, and all going towards the same uh, the same goal, which is, you know, getting approval for a very specified endpoint that's going to satisfy um, as many folks as possible. I mean, you can't please everybody, uh -huh. but um, but but that is that is sort of the goal. I think that that and the the concept or the the framework that Max and I are are um, are proposing here or trying to push. Um, so I, you know, we as developers were very conscious of of having to meet various requirements, but I, d I don't think that we we generally think of our patients and caregivers and, and physicians and everything as end users. Um, and and I can't emphasize um, enough either the importance of starting a TPP as early as possible um, in development. I think it. You know, it's a. Some folks think of it as a nice to have. Some folks think of it as a late stage activity. Oh, I'm getting ready to do my label, so maybe I should uh, finally, you know, put one together. But it can really be an overarching. You can use it as a plan um, to direct the entire development program. I think in the importance of time, I need to. <laughs> I need to go on. So, uh, you know, so not only getting getting those payers involved, having conversations with them, having conversations with um, the regulators to make sure that you're aligned and, and the path that you're going down is going to satisfy their needs um, as well early early on, but also leveraging uh, real world data and non-traditional, we'll just broaden it out to non-traditional data sources is um, for, for all sorts of different purposes. I mean, pre and post approval, right? So, you know, as an example, Zolgensma, you know, their phase three had a natural history control. Um, so natural history studies, natural history data is, you know, considered non-traditional, whereas traditional is your, your randomized control um, study, including your clinical outcomes assessments. Um, so, you know, the encouragement here, the the take home message is um, since you can, you know, uh, regulators are open to non-traditional data for both pre and post approval um, functions or, or, you know, satisfying those requirements. There's no reason to not design um, a longitudinal prospective real world data collection strategy that integrates um, both clinical study data and any kind of uh, patient, you know, patient focused, patient derived real world data from various sources all across your development program. Obviously, some of the prospective planning and setup and, you know, say you're doing a, you're establishing your own registry maybe early on. Uh, in development, those things come with costs, and then you know you could use uh, data from from folks like Max's group to substantiate that it's actually valid <laughs> and, a, and a worthwhile expenditure. Um, but if you have that uh, real world and clinical trial data sort of prospectively designed such that um, it can all work together and in, in concert, it's just going to strengthen your application packages and strengthen your value proposition. Um, and it is worth noting that. Uh, any any kind of data, no matter um, traditional or non-traditional, whatever, needs to be collected um, with the same kind of method, methodological rigor um, that you would have employed in a in a traditional randomized control trial. I just have to say that as a as a scientist and a data person. So, um, Emily, um, Emily, there's a there's a question from the audience here, so I just want to there is okay. Read that. Yep. So, um, question is for gene therapies in the U.S. Do you expect the enrolled po enrolled population to always be the reimbursable one from a payer perspective, or could we see expanded coverage in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, assuming um, price concessions or performance outcome based agreement. Um, so to sort of the first part of that question, uh, do I expect the enrolled population to always be reimbursable, um, to always be the, the reimbursable one? De definitely not. I mean, there, the, as I as I alluded to, it's it's most acute during the uh, you know, when you have a when you have an accelerated approval because the payer has some real uh, you know, some real good logic to stand on there and say, look, you have not demonstrated a clinical clinical benefit in these patients. Um, and, 
that's part of your post-market commitment and that's fine. Um, and I understand I also have to, you know, treat patients uh, and provide access to innovative medicines and so forth. So the access will be sort of limited to that uh, enrolled population where you have uh, actually shown the benefit. But you know, if it's not a if it's not an accelerated approval and there is, um, you know, there 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 is a a more relevant clinically meaningful endpoint that's that's uh, available at launch to support the value. Um, that that scenario I went through is, is you know probably less uh, less likely. Uh, but the second part of your the the, the questioner's uh, question here is really related to um, where do we see these things going in the future? Like you know, should should developers, if I could broaden it a bit, should developers assume just as a standard that they're going to have to either have price concessions or some level of outcomes based uh, agreements? Um, that's a that's a big one, um, and I think that in terms of the overall commercial planning, it should definitely be assessed. Outcomes based agreements are not, um, you know, they're not amenable to every single area, every single patient population, indication, etc. Um, so it's 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 a piece of the commercial strategy that should certainly be assessed, but. I'm not sure that it's going to be applicable, uh, you know, to to every. Otherwise, you know, frankly, we we would have seen more of them um, already. So, and Max, one of the things that I've heard from patients too is is a mirrored complaint. Um, you know that you know I've I've heard several patient groups, you know, voice concerns that well, you're only enrolling this very small, you know, uh, very very restrained population, but there are so many more of us who are putting our hands up and we're willing to you know to to uh, you know be to receive this this drug, but they feel like they can't get it and that they're being excluded because their disease isn't severe enough or they don't have, you know, one of the, they don't meet one of the inclusion or exclusion criteria. So it's it's interesting right. that, you know, you, you, you're, it's almost like the payers and the patients on that one are, are going a little bit more in parallel. <laughs> yep. And just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna jump to this one. Sure. Um, couple of, you know, couple of, uh, as we look across the, uh, the development timeline here, um, we really see this as as uh, four parts. In the early phases, you're identifying value, and, he, and down here are some commercial, regulatory, and then patient-focused recommendations to do that. Uh, when you get to your phase three or you know, so whatever you're calling your pivotal trial, uh, the number is sort of fungible these days. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> irrelevant. Here, here's where you're creating the value that you will have to support uh, support your launch. And then over here in submission, this is really demonstrating that value. And then with our with pricing and and ultimate access, this is where the manufacturer is capturing value. So you know, looking across these, um, I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time, but you know, we have some commercial recommendations in uh, yellow, um, some regulatory uh, recommendations in green, and some uh, patient, uh, patient-based, how we can incorporate patient-based data in, uh, in blue. And I'll just wrap up by saying um, this group, uh, Sertara, uh, the, the, the folks that work on gene therapies in Sertara, uh, we have a wealth of experience in this, in this space. Uh, 60 plus assessments um, in rare diseases, 22 of those being in gene therapy across regulatory science, value, access, and pricing in the last two years. And so with that, uh, well, I, think we're, I think we're right at the hour. <laughs> right at the hour. I did get a question if we have time, uh, Claire, for one about long-term follow-up. Somebody did ask uh, about that. I was just going to mention that, you know, there is an entire guidance on long-term follow-up recommendations um, and uh, the general, the general uh, recommendation can be up to 15 years. Um, for viral vectors that integrate into the genome, um, or if they go latent, um, FDA would like to see about 15 years for those as well. Um, definitely, if it edits the genome, that's that's pretty much a 15-year follow-up. Um, or for microbes that might establish a, a persistent infection, if you're using a microbial vector, um, it's the generalized recommendation is about five years for AAV 
uh, base vectors. So, um, but there's an entire guidance on on that as well. Lots of recommendations. So. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for this robust discussion. And thank you to everyone that uh, tuned in. And have a great Friday, great weekend, everyone. Thank you again, um, Emily and Max. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye.